everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. And I am Richard Rodoham. Well, we're glad to see you all after it has been weeks. I don't know what. Well, we haven't yeah, got what together. what happened last week? You called me out of the blue and said, I cannot do it, Captain. Comcast. I yeah. mean, and that's not a joke. I mean, it was really the Internet just went down. Now, honestly, it came up at like, I think, 201. But I was like, well, it's too late now, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and also, we weren't sure that it might not go down immediately. And Comcast was like, ah, oh, yeah, you know. But they do give us a credit every time Kenny calls. Oh, really? Okay. Because you can get a credit. For, you know, we, we say, hey, our business was down. And um, so hopefully yeah. it won't go down in the future. But I don't know. So it well, seems like it's been. racking those sweet credits up. <laughs> <There's> nothing else. <laughs> the sweet credits. The amount I pay Comcast, I better get those credits. <laughs> um, the gouging. I just did my taxes, and I was like, man, Comcast is my number one bill. I wow. pay more for Comcast than I pay for, like, water and electricity combined. It's, it's ridiculous. Well, as I recall, you have two lines running into that, into Dice Tower Studios, right? Well, we do, but that's the, the secondary line, AT&T, is not a oh. really good line. It's just there that we can get, when Comcast invariably goes down, we can still work. But we can't stream on that line because the studio is not on the main path here in Miami. So, um, you know, we once we can get that, then goodbye, Comcast and hello, AT&T. By the way, I, I led you astray. You didn't start with your, hey, everybody, how's the volume levels? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. They are already commenting that you are blowing them out and I'm whisper quiet. You're right. I turned my uh, doc. I turned my mic up. All right. I'm going to argue that this blowing them out might be somewhat exaggeration on your part. But all right. I, I am perhaps a bit known for my hyperbole. Hey. Also, it's the first time since we've done this where me and Rado can both talk to you guys about Gloomhaven because <laughs> we've been talking back and forth about it <laughs> for a while yeah. now. Yep. Christmas came early. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and this is, uh, I've already said it in the review, but, man, we were just talking about it. It's such a good, they, this could have been really fumbled. It really could have been. You know, it could have been fumbled to the point of it being too complex to be on the shelf at Target or being so dumbed down that a Gloomhaven player wouldn't like it. But if, if someone was like, I'm interested in Gloomhaven, I wouldn't even point them to Gloomhaven. I'd say get this first every mm -hmm. single time. I don't yeah. care how heavy of a gamer you are. Speaking yeah, and I that, admit, um, I, I uh, got a prototype for Frosthaven, you know, the next big box in the series to cover it when it was on Kickstarter for its monster uh, campaign a few months ago. And I so wish I could have played this first um, because this was such a gentle... You know, going back into the pool, uh, you know, it, it, it's it, it's a delicate tightrope, like you say, and it just nails it. And I hope, I hope for Frosthaven's sakes, it's not too late to take the lessons learned in the development of this and apply them to any and all future travels in that world. I agree. I was down, Rod, I'm thinking about starting a petition. I'll pay money for a book of maps for both Gloomhaven and Frosthaven, those books, even if they have to have two supplemental books, it's worth it. You know, it's, it's fantastic. That could um, be the ultimate, um, fan led initiative too. I could imagine fans, um, you know, scanning all of the, you know, I don't know how Cephalofair would feel about that. They've usually been pretty cool about that. Like when they release, Hey, we've had to make changes to the cards. Here's the art assets. If you want to print them out yourself. But yeah. still, I would rather an official Frost Haven. I, I agree. Super also, thick book. There are some of these games that they're putting on the internet. They're like, hey, free print and play. I'm like, I don't think you know what the word free is. Because <gasps> print and play ain't free. <laughs> if you own a color printer, it's not even yeah. close. We're bleeding uh, tone. Yeah. So, so speaking of that, um, quick question for you here. When you get a game yeah. and you don't know a whole lot about it. Yeah, you've read the rules. You know how the game works and everything. But you're not sure. And it tells you. Here are the different levels you can play on. Where do you tend uh -huh. to go? It's like, uh, let's say a co-op game, and they say easy, normal, hard, and nightmare. What do you pick? I, I, I would usually just go on normal, um, unless I got a sense. I, I never go on easy. And the, the other, the ancillary question of that is, if you get a game and it says, hey, here's the introductory rules, 
And by the way, in, in the final, when you're, when you're ready, after you play a few times, here's the full version. I always skip to the end of the book and go straight full version. I don't think I've ever regret. I think I maybe regretted that choice once. And I can't I remember what he I definitely means. regretted that choice. I'm trying to think. There's, wow, there's a couple games where I was like, wow, there's just too much extra going on. And sometimes, I just recently played a game where I thought the extra rules, I was like, wow, the base game was fine. The extra rules kind yeah. of messed things up. But mm. I am... Let me look if it's over there on the shelf. Eh, I don't think so. Eh, I don't know what it was. It was a game, out, and I remember thinking, man, the base game was fine, and then they added this random extra stuff in here for mm. these extra rules. Yeah, that can happen. But, um, yeah, I, I always just want to go into the deep end of the pool wherever possible. All right, people want to know, as always, what are you playing this is a wonderful dice cooperative game called Intrepid. Uh, each player controls a team of astronauts on the International Space Station. You might have Malaysian astronauts. I might have um, you know, South American astronauts. They come from different places around the world. And it is uh, rolling dice and doing worker placement stuff, activating our own modules, activating the common modules, and trying to keep track on these really cool big dials of our power, our climate, our oxygen, our nutrition, because if we don't, we will all die. Uh, and wouldn't you know, there's a meteor shower. Of course there is. So there's leaks popping up all over the place, and it's excellent. Tom, this game makes me realize something that I feel is missing in most cooperative games. The ability to, hey, everybody's ready to go, let's all play at the same time. Not, okay, player one, then two, then three, and then one, then two, then three, but having the freedom to say, oh, wait, no, 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 if you don't do that, if I do this first, I can give you this die, and you could use this one instead of the one you're thinking of using. This game, it just some co-op games do that, don't they? Yeah, it's very rare. There are a couple, like um, Spirit Island did it. Uh, says, hey, you, there, there is an overall round structure, but when you're in this phase, when you're playing cards, you can play cards in whatever order you want, and I think I would like to see that more. Even Pandemic kind of does it, is it has a round structure, but you can play your event cards on anybody's turn. I, I, I don't know if this is if we're ever going to get to this. Simultaneous play, I imagine, is probably a mechanism. Spoiler alert, folks, I think it's awesome. It's one of my favorite things. So everybody, simultaneous reveal, you see that in a lot of you know competitive games. I want more simultaneous um, player action resolution in co-ops because it's excellent here. All oh, right. and it's on Kickstarter right now, too. It just it just went live this morning. There's a lot of interesting projects on Kickstarter at the moment, for sure. It's interesting, yep. the whole Kickstarter thing, because when the, when we first went into quarantine, Kickstarter dipped, right? And Kickstarter yeah. has announced that they are making less money at some point recently. Mm -hmm. But, man, there is no shortage to projects being released. No shortage of big projects being released. And, Successful projects, yeah. Right, and and there's a lot of good stuff. Like, if you were someone who's like, ha, 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 the one good thing about the quarantine is at least it will cure my FOMO and I won't buy everything, you're still going to go broke. Yeah, Kickstarter says, hold my games. beer, and, and here they come. It, it, we're living through a golden age of pirate board game simulations as it happens right now. Must be like 30% of all of them are pirate-themed in some it way. Definitely, we do go through these phases. These, phases of themes and things and the roll and write phase was a big thing and i think that's slowly coming to an end you're here. wrong we'll let me just channel suzanne for you you're wrong no i'm not saying it's bad Roll i'm just saying never die i'm saying Again, what's the next thing <laughs> the, the, <laughs> so we got pirates is definitely on on the table polyominoes is still going strong yeah yeah i just I just played Uwe Rosberger's still not done. I was reading about a couple of new ones he's got coming out. More little lightweight, you know, the New York Zoo and another one. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, man. All righty. Well, let's get through this uh, mechanic mechanic real quick <laughs> since uh, Rado doesn't like this one. But we'll... I think I'm going to have to cede the floor to you on this one, yes. Well, I was wondering. Um, so, interestingly enough, okay, so this is bribery we're taking right. a look at here. And... Players offer bribes to other players to get them to perform specific actions. And I was trying to think if there is a game that's two-player with this in it. So when I, I looked at the games here, and so if we look at the list, we see Sheriff of Nottingham. Obviously, that's a, obviously that's a, a big one here. Let's sort these. Yeah, you might have a passing familiarity with that. Sure. Uh, in fact, the second edition is coming out, which I don't have a familiarity with. I'd like to see that. 
Santiago, it's been so long since I played Santiago. I mean, it came out in 2003, so I don't want to say it's been 17 years, but it's probably been 15 years since I played it, actually. You know, I'm could... going to take a step back and say I understand what bribery is. I understand what negotiation <laughs> is. I think we... <laughs> what's, what's the difference in terms of board games, though? I mean, there's lots of negotiation games, and surely bribery is a big part of negotiation. So I, I, I need to look. Why, why did Jeff pull this out for its own little separate? Oh, because sub- bribery means – so you, there's a lot of games you can negotiate, but you're not allowed to bribe. Um, you mm-hmm. know, I can't say here is here is a good that I'm giving you. Um, in I, in Sheriff of Nottingham. Okay, uh, tell me about Sheriff of Nottingham. So in Sheriff of Nottingham, I am showing you. For folks who don't know, Tom was the uh, was was a co-designer on Sheriff of Nottingham. No, no, I'm not just, co-designer. No, 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 I'm not co-designer. Oh, okay, I, I I just facilitated it being in Dice Tower Essentials. Um, oh, is that the case? Okay, my mistake. Uh, right, right. I designed part of the expansion. Oh, I'm but... thinking of yeah, the the mafia one. Right, right. Nothing personal. Yeah. Sure, that has bribery in it too. But in Chair for Nottingham, you have a pack. I'm I'm giving you these cards and saying this is three eggs or whatever or three hens, and you say no, it's not. And if you open it and I'm wrong, I pay you. And if you're wrong and I was telling the truth, you pay me. However, that doesn't sound like bribery. No, I know. However, you say I'm going to open. I'll say before you open it. I'll pay you five points okay. to not open it. Right, so that's right, not right. necessarily, I mean, yes, it's negotiation, but it's a, it's a specific kind where I'm paying you to not do an action or to do an action. Um, so, yes, it's a subset of negotiation, but I could see people who like negotiation not liking bribery. Hmm. Because in negotiation, I could say, I'll give you three pink cubes, you give me two blue. Great. And, and then the other guy at the table will say... I'll give you four coins if you don't do that. Like, wait a minute, yeah. what? That's a that's a completely different. That's not negotiation anymore. Well, said, I mean, I think it still is. It seems to me more. It's a question of an, if you're saying this is a negotiation game, bribery could come into it, but there's nothing in the rules officially defining how the transfer of goods and what you are bribing for. Whereas, like I said, in in uh, Nottingham, it's very, very clear. I will give you this money for this particular result. Here's the rules for how it works. That's, to me, what it sounds like, the difference between bribery and negotiation Well, is. they also mention here that it says bribery in some games, you you put, put a bribe on an action, and if someone else takes that action, they get the bribe. Hmm. So I actually, what is a game I just put? There's a game that I play with this all the time where we put coins on something, and if you take that, oh, it's the other game. It's another Dice Tower Essentials game. Um, that uh, It's a good day for the Dice Tower Essential line, apparently. Yeah, well, I tend to like bribery. But basically, I'll give you a voting card. And, and you look at the voting card, and it says yes or no. And I put a coin on top of it, or, or some money on top of it. And I'll say, if you vote that way, you get that money. Okay. And then if you do vote that way, you get what the money. What is this if game? You don't, the money comes back. Uh, <laughs> you think I would know it off the top of my head. I would um, imagine you're putting your name on it. Why, um, man, I'm having a major, oh, no. I can't We've remember, I can't remember either the, uh, this is going to be a long episode, folks. Get comfortable. I, I am, I am, uh, I'm going to the series of Dice Tower Wait, what's the name of your oldest game. daughter? No, that's Melody. Uh, good Critters. Good Critters is the name of the game. Okay. So Good, good Critters, um, which was a re-implementation of Teeth Toshin. All right, so Good Critters, and which, thank you, people in the chat. Uh, yes. Uh, and Good oh, Critters, you're voting on who, on the president. gives He splits the money each round, and then you're going to vote yes or no on whether you agree with that split or not, and you can bribe other people at the table to vote mm. a specific way. So, yes, again, it's negotiation, but I think it's a subset. I think it's okay to pull out on its own. Um, yeah. Although, once again, there's not a lot of games in here. Yeah, because people are not aware it's been pulled out on its own. I don't know if this will show up later in Jeff's mechanisms, but I wonder, have you ever seen the kind of auction where you you, you uh, pick something and I say, okay, Rado, this card is yours for five coins. But if you don't pay five coins, I'm forced to pay the five coins and buy it. Yeah, that's uh, the uh, Isle of Sky, right? Mechanism. Right. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of different games that have that sort of thing yep. in them. I don't know if that's bribery or not. It's kind of a... It, it's it's bribery with consequences. 
Although, I mean, in the case of Isle of Sky, I generally, please don't. I'm, I'm putting the value as low as possible, as high enough to scare you away while not being so high that it would bankrupt me to get it because I want it, you know? Hmm. All right, well, that's that's uh, bribery. We're not yeah. going to go into it much more. It's an interesting one, but we are now done with the bees. So I guess the question here would be, what is going to be? Oh, my gosh, are we? Well, there wasn't many bees. So yep. once we're done with bribery, now we're going into C. Next time, campaign, battle card driven. We might skip that one because we don't play a lot of wars. We'll look at it and get card drafting. 100%, I know we played that one. Uh, I think, yeah, <laughs> I, I've got a passing familiarity with that mechanism, definitely. All right, to the top five. I'm back, but I forgot a pen. Hang on. <laughs> Don't leave me hanging, man. Well, I do not have any controls over this ship. Yeah, that's true. All right. All right, folks. Give us some, some ideas for top fives. And, that are uh, game related. Or that are game related. related. Yep. Ooh, that's a good one. All righty. Oh, that's a good one, too. And uh, let's see here. <laughs> I don't think I could put. Oh, okay. I'll put that on the list. <gasps> okay. It's a funny one, I th or I think so. Anyway, we'll find and, out. And <laughs> uh, top five technical difficulties. Thanks. <laughs> um, man, I don't know if that's a one we could even do. Probably not enough. All right. Ooh, okay. These are both. These are interesting. Okay, All so right. you, got, you have like a, an interesting slot here. I'm excited. Right. So here we go. You can pick top five premium components, okay. or top five non-generic fantasy settings, or <laughs> top five games to play at 3 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> or the top five Kickstarter incentives. Wow. I told you, interesting. Th those are good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if we do that Kickstarter one, we'll make people, no matter what, um, is it top five uh, most morally acceptable or top five most successful? Oh, that's true. On that's that. true. <laughs> <laughs> there is a difference between those two. You're right. Ah, oh, boy. Um, let's see. Deluxe components, I, I'm sorry, I... I, I it doesn't speak to me. I generally tend not to worry so much about premiums. The Kickstarter one is cool. The 3 a.m. one was cool. And the other one was what? Non-generic fantasy settings. Non-generic fantasy. And that's the one I'm sure you were thinking, I don't know if we can come up with it. No, that wasn't the one I was thinking. There was one that I did pick that's called Top 5 Games Involving the Human Body as a Theme. And I was like, ah, I got like two, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's a tricky one. I mean, I guess a lot of party games, sort of. Um, I like the 3 a.m. <laughs> Ooh, the Baby, one. it's 3 a.m. I must be lonely. So let's talk about games. All right, let me find the... Uh, who said that one? Monica for sale. Top five games to play at 3 in the morning. All righty. Well... You scared me? Oh, sometimes. I don't know if anybody else has a song stuck in their head now. Are we going to agree that we, we would be tired at 3 a.m.? I think that's the pre presumption, yes. That okay. we are not night okay. owls. Um, <laughs> that for some reason, we should have gone to bed at least three hours ago, and yet we soldier on. Man, I tell you, I've done this a few times in my life. I, I bet. I done the, uh, besides the 24-hour marathons, one time Sam uh, Healy and I, were we were doing a yard sale. And it was a big yard sale for the school make, to make money. And there was mm -hmm. a ton of stuff to set up, so we decided to set everything up the night before. So everyone came in that night and said, and so, so people didn't have to come in at four in the morning to set up. So everyone set up the night before, and then we're like, all right, me and Sam will stay here all night and watch the stuff. Okay. So we played board games all night long to try to stay awake. But man, <laughs> that was a tough call. Also, <laughs> I learned that dew in the morning affects board games tremendously. Oh, 
Ooh. Really? Because we were we were playing outside on the table. It uh-huh. wasn't very windy. And I was like, man, these cards keep getting water on they them. Are, Where's this coming they from? They are curling like nobody's business. Yeah. So fortunately, it was the kind of game I could wipe off. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Well, the first one that pops see. into my mind, I mean, you know, you know, the obvious thing is to go for stuff on the lighter end. Uh, and, um, you know, and maybe something that would work well in an altered state of mind, depending on just how tired you are. I got to say Dixit. My only concern with Dixit is, is that there will be moments where people are thinking quietly. Oh, that's a good point. Okay. And that's a chance to nod off. Fix it might work. I'm going to write it down as a maybe. I mean, okay. I'm, not, I'm not opposed to it. I'm just wondering if that's a, a thing. Yeah. If we were doing a top 20, you'd, you'd allow it. But at top five, we have to be picky. <laughs> we got to be picky. Gotta be oh, picky. this is very important. So let's, I'm trying to think of, okay, so this is easy. It would be easy just to say party games, right? But I'm trying to think of non-party games. The one party I'm game cool with that, that yeah 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 let's and and this is is kind of partyish no, yeah no, I'm not I, saying I'm not I, saying let's, we, yeah we, let's let's make this tough let's say non-party games to play at 3 a.m. so oh we don't word. just say okay. oh yeah just one and and all of that all right well that just got a lot tougher why did we do did. this I, I was actually just saying we should do it as an exercise but all right I'm adding the word non-party up here all right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I see. Oh, well, no, for I... me, if it, the game has a good story involved, I'll stay Ooh. awake. Uh-huh. So the one game I have played at three in the morning and stayed awake and wasn't bored at all was Seventh Continent. Because Ooh. we were constantly – because in that game, everybody is doing everything all the time. Even if you take an action – we're all talking about it. What's the best yeah. action to take and how many cards should you flip over? And then we turn over the next card and see what happens. You're never sitting there waiting for someone else to make a move. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It does get fairly complex with the hand management, though, doesn't it? Or do you not think so? What do you mean by hand management? You mean that, that – well, you only have a few cards in your hand, really. Yeah, but, I mean, d- deciding when to, you know – Spend your cards and whatnot. Sure, but it's because it's a cooperative game. You, everyone else is helping you. It's not like you have to hide them and keep them in your in your hand. You can show everyone your cards. Okay. Yeah, and it and it has a boy. I mean, that's a good way to get yourself killed, though. <laughs> oh, I don't um, care about that. I always play in easy mode anyway. Mm-hmm. Oh, go okay, through, okay. Go through the well, deck okay, twice. Well, so, okay, 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 then. Um, seventh Continent in easy mode. I think I would go with that. <laughs> I'm glad we're putting these caveats on here. All right. What's the thing? I don't want to die. I don't, I don't want to take it seriously. Um, here's one. Here's another one. I guess it's kind of border. No, it's a gamer's game. It's not a gamer's game, but it's a gateway type game. Um, Call to Adventure. You know, it popped in my head when you said you would like something that has a narrative. I mean, that's a game where we're all working together to create life narratives for these characters there is some interesting decisions to make although it's still kind of on the light side i'm probably looking forward to the new call to adventures that are based on themes Mm -hmm. um i I just played i actually did play call to adventure at bgg con last year i played it with somebody at like seven in the morning and i was kind of like a little tired but yeah it worked yeah well anyway they're making a call call to the adventure name of the wind came out this year i didn't see it or play it and then call adventure stormlight archives coming out next oh this wow year. so they're taking the same system and applying it to different settings i guess yeah okay that's cool i i think it's probably just going to be art for the most part okay well what do you think of that one then oh i'm good with it yeah yeah okay cool cool, cool. i've been super easy on most of these yeah yeah but, but one day I will brook no nonsense. But that day is not today. <laughs> and with no advance warning. I think we're going to need a safe word for that, quite frankly. Um, oh, oh, well, that might be considered a party game. I was going to say, I'm, I'm looking at some of the comments. and let, let's, let's go through some of the... Uh, yeah, 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 definitely. This okay, could be a good so, usual exercise. Uh, we got Mansions of Madness. Oh, for the spooky factor. Yeah, and also the story that's along with it. 
you know. Yeah. Um, we have One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which definitely, although I have been in a werewolf game, not One Night Ultimate Werewolf, but I've been in a werewolf game where someone yeah. fell asleep at night because you're telling people to close their eyes. <laughs> I believe the <laughs> phrase is, everybody close your eyes. Yeah, and speaking in a deep, calming, reassuring voice. And some people just don't open their eyes. Then we got Point Salad. We that's got a good one. Down point Salad, boy, that's just, that, that can work anytime, anyplace. Yeah, it really can. It's, it's easy. I'll, I'll write it on the short list here. Yeah. Um, we got Downforce, racing game. Mm -hmm. um, pandemic? No, nah, I don't think so. That's, that's those... That's a cooperative game where there'll be moments where you'll stop and think really hard about what to do next. Yeah. I do like the idea of getting at least one creepy, spooky, you know, oh, this is moody, atmospheric kind of thing. And, you know, that you know kind if of I'm going to vote for that, I like Mansions of Madness. I think it's a really great game. But I, I think at 3 a.m., I would prefer to play Betrayal at House on the Hill. I was just going to say House on the Hill. Um, because it's so here's the goofy, question. and I would don't care. Would everybody fall asleep in the first half? No. As you're just walking around blindly from because room to you're room reading, waiting. you're reading those cards, I think people might fall asleep when you're waiting for the guy to come back. <laughs> Who, who's the traitor? And she goes off and she's reading and everyone's sitting here like, all right, all right, all right. What'd you get? Come on. We need to get this started. <laughs> the halftime show. Um, yeah, I mean, that one popped into my head. That was like um, when you said Mansions of Man, the first thing I thought of was Betrayal. Yeah, I like um, Betrayal. Is, is, is Betrayal Legacy, did, did it, I mean, it, I mean, it is a little old-fashioned. I mean, it, it's certainly a game that has always had some rough edges that can use some modernization. I didn't play all the way through Betrayal Legacy. I only played the first three games, I think. Um, yeah. And I keep meaning to play through it, but I am, I'm currently doing a weekly Legacy game with my kids. And we're playing through Rise of Queensdale right now. So Rise of Queensdale is almost finished. If my daughter wins the next game, then it's over. Um, no. So we're oh. getting close to that one, and the kids are loving it. So I think we're gonna we're moving to Clank Legacy after that. But then I think Betrayal Legacy will come after that because they, you know, I tried. I know this is weird, but one of the first ones I tried was Pandemic Legacy, and they were not as into that. But they, for some reason, Rise of Queensdale is the huh. the bee's knees. I don't get it. Yeah, well, it's as soon as they got to put a beard on their character. I think that's what did it for. You know what? That is what part of it. <laughs> <laughs> um. No matter what their character was. Beards for everybody. Pitch car. Although that kind of gets close to party game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw Mysterium as well. And again, that's great for mood and atmosphere, but that can get surprisingly thinky. Ooh, Project Elite is a good choice. In fact, any real time. Real time. Yeah, it's just a question of which one. Ooh. Well, have you played the new hospital no, one? No, the new, the new uh, come on version. I am no, patiently... No, not, not not not, oh. not Project Elite. I'm also patiently waiting. Yeah. Um, no, the 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 hospital one from Artipia. Oh oh, uh, Rush MD. Have you played that one? Because that's also uh, a not insignificant amount of dexterity as well. And um, you know, being a little exhausted, getting that jolt. I like that one a lot. I mean, that's, that's I just too. a really sharp game. Yeah. Oh, I like that. List. I like the mix of uh, 3 a.m. dexterity and real-time panic. Right, because you're not going to be sitting around doing nothing. And there's a lot of these games from Escape to Rush MD to uh, fast, uh, the, the food one, uh, Fast Food Franchise? Uh, oh, I forget what uh, it's called. Uh, oh, uh, Kitchen Rush. Kitchen Walk Rush. Star. Yep. Uh, other people are saying... Oh, Nightmare VHS. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty funny. Um, Mysterium, yeah, that, that's where you are. You're ahead of me, I guess, in the comments. Yeah, yeah. What on the clock tower? Again, I'm a, little, I'm a little worried about any kind of social deduction game because if you pause and there's any kind of pause in the conversation, you'll fall asleep. Or if there's elimination like Werewolf and you're waiting for other people to finish, you will fall asleep. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I know that blood on the clock tower. Some people say that people are involved the whole time, but I haven't played it, so I can't say. Ooh, Forgotten Waters, that might work, but Rado has not played that one. Oh, yet. that's the new. Uh, that's one of the other pirate games, right? Yeah, the one that's really narrative focused. Yeah, I still think. Yeah, hey, that's actually a, you know something that uses an app to increase the ambiance. 
By the way, you need to get that, Roy. Uh, Mike has played it two players and says it works with two. Really? Yeah. Then why don't they put that on the box? Well, I, I think that's okay if they don't put it on the box. If it if, if they don't think it's best with two, I'd rather them do that than lie. I guess so. That's you've been burned point. before, I'm sure, by getting a game that says it's for two. And More it's than once. Not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have now have a spidey sense for that kind of thing. Definitely. Trick taking games, um, Magic the Gathering, poker. Uh, the crew? No, nah, man. The crew. I would fall asleep. I love the crew, that's but I would fall asleep. That's very cerebral. That's a lot of waiting for people to puzzle stuff out. We actually had, uh, we were playing a game the other day, and someone said, we pulled out this trick-taking game, and I was reading the rules for it, and I was like, this trick-taking game is okay. It's not as good as the crew. And then I paused, and I was like, wait. So we got out the crew. We just played the crew for a while. (laughs) (laughs) It's easily one of the most played games for me in the last 12 months, for sure. Um, TI4, no. A Ouija board. That's not a game. Uh, I saw somebody quacks a Quinlanburg. That that well, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm putting that right on the show. That's a, because... yeah, that gets your blood pumping. It's a it's a simple repetitive activity. There will be people fist pumping and hooting and hollering and and crying in pain and despair, and with a little bit of crunch to it, a little bit of stuff to noodle on, but not too much. That's a good one. I think we, we have five here. We just need to we need oh, to cut okay. one. We have six. We need to cut one of these. Oh, okay. All right, so we have seven, Seventh Continent, Easy Mode, Call to Adventure, Point Salad, Betrayal at House on the Hill, Rush MD, and Quacks of Quedlingburg. Honestly, I know I was so hot on you know spooky narrative, but I, I dropped um, Betrayal on that one. Just because it, it can't, I mean, depending on the mission you get, you can get a mission that just drags. All right. All right. Done. <laughs> You're welcome, Monica. Don't you all wish government bodies work like this? We'd be done with things <laughs> so much faster. Yeah. Seventh, seventh Continent, Easy Mode, Call to Adventure, Points Out, Rush MD, Quacks of Quellingburg. I got to say, of these five, if it was three, you were like, I might pick Rush MD because I'm pretty sure that one would wake me up the most. And I really like these real time cooperative games to the point where I think yeah. I'm going to make a top 10 on it soon. And that one is nigh near the top. It's such a good theme. Yes, definitely. Healing people, I've always found to be a fun theme, but I'm always a little worried about it because I don't like the grossness of it. Like, I don't like watching ER and those TV shows because I don't need to see people's guts spilling out or what have you. And it's not in this game. You are actually healing people, but they don't show you anything. I did a top 10 with Royal Gavioli the other day, and, and we were talking about it. He hadn't played it yet. And when I extrived, he said, oh, so it's like a, a Gamer Geek version of uh, Operation. Because I was explaining how, you know, that that, that, that heart meeple can be slippery. With oh, those man, that heart meeple is a pain to, get it. to pick up. Yep. All right, cool. Well, hey, we still got time for questions. Let's Do get it. to them. Wherever my question intro is, here it is. Button. Find the button. Oh, no, it says it can't find the video questions. Well, well then Hold we're just going right to questions. All right, let's do a little dance. Like everybody does, I'm sure, during the intro. There we go. All righty. Why is it? I wonder where that video went. Well, whatever. All righty. Questions. First question from Monica, the same person who gave us a top ten. All right. Have you ever, have you experienced anything scary in life? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some assumptions here with this question that she does not mean something to the effect of my child almost died or a loved one was in danger at the hospital, because I think we can all agree that that's scary. I, I assume she means spooky, since we were talking so much about spooky thematic stuff. I mean, yeah, surely I've, you know, I've been in a car accident, um, and I've been in life-threatening situations. I've, I have also bungee jumped and jumped out of a plane. Those were very scary. But uh, in terms of spooky, creepy, hmm, hmm, you know... I remember as a kid, I really did get nightmares a lot. Um, and I and I remember waking up in the middle of the night, and you know my parents were halfway across the house, and that really just you know, being terrified afterwards as I kind of you know came down from that adrenaline rush of, you know, I mean, I literally remember Frankenstein's monster chasing me. I mean, you know, I mean, they, they were a little kid scare fright type things. Um, you know, or, or gosh, the Wizard of Oz, the Wicked Witch. My parents, uh, I was always watching TV right up at the TV, but then when the Wicked Witch come out, I mean, my parents to this day make fun of how I'd always back, 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 back towards them on the couch. And so I think that stuff got in my head. So as a little kid, I think I was 
uh, you know, frightened of stuff under the bed or in the closet when I would wake up from a nightmare. But as an adult, no, I don't. I've never seen anything paranormal or creepy or anything. I think so too. I mean, sometimes I'll on the internet I'll, I'll see like scary pictures where they'll show like a normal picture and you see like this guy looking out the window or a face in the background. And I, I'm not someone who likes that stuff. That stuff scares me. Horror movies scare me. Uh, as a kid, I was the same as Rado. I would have nightmares. I don't have those anymore. Now my nightmares are like, you didn't do your taxes. Also, you went to work naked and <laughs> you left your keys at home. Stuff like that. Um, yeah. I, I, the last time I remember being scared like of horror stuff was in college. It was mm. Halloween. And my roommate said, let's read horror stories back and forth to each other. So we did. We were reading these horror stories back and forth. And it was like nerve wracking. Mm. And meanwhile, the guy in the room next to us came and hid in the closet, in the, like in the laundry basket. And then I got up to go to the bathroom, and he came out, and I almost punched him in the face. And I'm not a violent man at all, really, but that scared me very much. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that wasn't like real scared. I mean, like I didn't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no Scooby-Doo scares for me, I'm afraid. Scooby-Dooby-Doo. All right. Ari, Ari Cole, I don't know how to pronounce that, sorry, says, what do you do when you eventually get bored of playing the game you really love? While playing or just, I've just... I guess you just, you suddenly realize like, hey, just not a fan of Gloomhaven anymore. What? You shut your I'm mouth. Just... <laughs> hmm. I'm trying to think of when that's happened. I mean, I, I, I suspect, Tom, you're like me. We are in a situation where that literally cannot happen because of the nature of our shows, the nature of every week, three to ten more games showed up. Well, it's and happened to me. And they're piling up over there. And but it's, it's time happened to, move to me on to in my thing. life. Yeah. Right? So it's happened to me in my life for sure. Yeah. Um, even now, I'm, I'm playing a lot of terraforming. I was, I was telling this to Bonacore, Terraforming Mars, they came out with the extra map expansion for it. And I was like, yeah, it's another map, whatever. You know, it, it's cool, but it's another map. Now that I play Terraforming Mars so many times on, on the app, I played a lot on the on the iPad. Mm -hmm. I'm like, huh, I could use another board for this. You know, I, I can see why you'd want the extra stuff. So expansions is one way. But honestly, if I really got bored of playing a game I really love, then I don't think I really love it anymore. And I would just switch to another game. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, there, it's not like we are spoiled for choice. There are plenty of other games. Um the only thing I can think of along these lines is, you know, back in the day, back in, I guess, the 90s? I guess, yeah, in the 90s, Jen and I played a lot of Magic the Gathering, back around 3rd edition Fallen Empire's Ice Age time. And we, and we played in local tournaments, and we really got into it for a sizable amount of time. And over time, we just kind of got fatigued with it, and it just dropped off and never picked back up. And I've certainly never really been tempted to go back. Not that I think they would fit uh, my the way I define myself as a gamer these days. But, yeah, if I'm tired, you know what? Hey, there's plenty of other fish in the sea. Time to move on. William says, are there any hidden benefits to the lack of gaming cons? Well, it's hidden benefits for uh, the makers of Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator. Sure. Um, I think there's a lot, actually. So, one is what Rado just said, you know, the... The online stuff, but not even just that. People have learned to use Zoom and webcams and play with each other online. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for people like us, it's definitely there's some benefits because we're one of the few ways a publisher can advertise their game. So be that as it may, I, that, that seems I, – I, I got to be careful about you know, saying that's a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. one, this is a small thing maybe for many people, but I noticed on Sunday was Father's Day. And my kids made me breakfast and made me cards. And I was like, cool, this is great. And I couldn't remember the last time this had happened. Because oh, wow. for the last eight, nine years, I've been out of town on Father's Day. And the kids would be like, well, you're out of town on Father's Day. And I was like, because it's Father's Day and I can do what I want. And I'm going to con. <laughs> you know, just it's origins it's has been away taking you, place. No, not really. But I mean, just I, know, I, know. Yeah. I don't care if people celebrate my birthday per se, you know. Um, and, but it was nice to be home with the kids. And I saw a lot of this sentiment online. A lot of people were like, yeah, normally I'm helping pack a booth up right now. Yeah. 
but I'm home. And so there is that. There's also the the getting ready for cons and going to a cons and the stress of all that. Although, don't get me wrong, this virtual con, which is starting tomorrow, and the Summer Spectacular is a lot of stress. Stressed. Yeah, I imagine. Speaking of which, I would get killed if I don't mention the virtual con. Maybe you should uh, drop a mention of what you're talking about, Tom. What do you mean? Yes, if you want to play games with other people, I'm going to be playing, like, tomorrow morning, I got a game Race for the Galaxy, and then a game of Terraforming Mars. Uh, you can play on Tabletopia, Tabletop Simulator, through Zoom. I'm playing a werewolf game of Zoom at one point. Um, and this is all through Virtual Gaming Con. It's a co-run by Board Game Geek and Dice Tower. But more importantly, they just launched just uh, a bit ago, and there's a link in the description of this video to a charity auction for this. They always run a charity auction at Board Game Geek Cons, and they couldn't do that this year, so they're doing one online. And ah. then some of the proceeds of this are going to the Jack Bass Memorial Fund, and there's some pretty cool stuff there. We're doing our box of wonderful goodness, which means... We're going to fill a box up with some guaranteed amazing games and some guaranteed horrible games. You know, it's, <laughs> and some stuff that you might not expect. So we do this every year, but we're doing a couple extra boxes this year. And so, like I said, there's a link in the description to that if you want to get involved in that. And registration and stuff, you can find all this on the front page of Board Game Geek and on yep. Dice Tower. And hey, to answer the original question, there's an advantage. If you were never going to make it to Indianapolis or Dallas or wherever, but you always wanted to play a game with Tom Vassell, now's your chance. Actually, I think the chances are actually harder. <laughs> so don't, don't get... Don't, You're saying those slots filled up quick? They really did. And it, I mean, I'm, I'm deliberately holding off. Like, I'm going to post some more games tomorrow. But I'm deliberately holding off. I'm posting them at different times so that people don't sign them all up for the same time. Speaking right. of virtual conventions uh, and uh, you know dropping notices, uh, Paul Grogan of Gaming Rules he does a yearly smaller, more intimate convention, and of course that's also been put on hold for the foreseeable future. So he's doing a virtual convention for GridCon this weekend, I believe. A little bit of competition for the big one Tom was just talking about. He also I is doing a charity auction, which I will be donating to. So that's one to look for as well, particularly if you're uh, on more of a European time zone. Although I know the virtual cons, there's an advantage. They are available to everybody worldwide. Um, that's true. Yeah, uh, that's a pretty big deal. And hopefully, you know, to go back to that other question, um, someone mentioned, we, me and Rado both mentioned this the other day, we are hoping that because the cons are not happening this year, that the release schedule is more staggered rather than having them all come out at Gen Con and all mm. come out at Essen. This way mm -hmm. we can all, each game will have maybe a little bit more of a chance to shine rather than being overshadowed because some great games every year get knocked out of contention because they happen to be released the same day as 20 other great games. Yeah, wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, we, yeah, we talked about this a few weeks ago, how the board game industry has really kind of emulated you know, uh, television back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. You know what? There's two times during the year where there's new stuff. And that's when all the shows come out. But in our new age of streaming, new shows are coming out all the time. So they have a better chance to find an audience. Maybe the board game industry could learn from that and not just try to put everything in August and October. Or at least, you know, 80%. So, yeah, that, that's, that's hopefully a good ongoing change to the industry um you know games are fun to play year round all right what's your favorite time length for a game timeline meaning setting meaning no, time length oh time length oh uh honestly probably just a straight 60 i'm, I'm happy with a 45 go once you go over 90 Okay, you've really got to give me a good reason to be here because uh, you know when we when we're hitting ninety, we're like, oh boy, maybe it's uh, to make time to make some quicker turns here. Um, and of course, there are many games we love at two or three hours, but yeah, I, I, a nice even sixty minutes in and out, moving on to the next thing, which for me and Jen is often another game. We often um, because of Jen's schedule. We will say, okay, next few days, we're just doing nothing playing games nonstop. We're having a little mini convention. And so that's always better to be able to have a high churn. Oh, and then here's a Vita Lasarda game. We're going to be here for three hours. <laughs> it's yeah, going to be great, I... but oh, you know. Sure. I, I think I'm, I lean more to the 90 minutes, but 60 minutes yeah. is fine by me, too. Mm -hmm. All right, are there I any guess games... maybe 60 minutes, too, because it's rare. It seems like the majority of the games are usually 
90 to uh, 120 minutes and like oh a sweet 60 when that comes along Mwah. i will tell you that the size of the box to the length of the game definitely affects <laughs> me like so okay. we're doing a game day and i'll be like all right let's play this game it's 90 minutes two hours great it's a big game okay now it's time for a filler here's a filler and now let's play another 90 to two hour game all right i'm gonna grab another small game off the shelf there's a little card game i'll pull it off look at it and it says 90 to two hours i'm like what this game's too small to be that long, and it goes back on the shelf. And because the game is small, it never gets pulled off to be the main course. Right. But it's also, I pull it off for filler time, like, nope, that's too long too for long. a filler. Yeah, it lives in that limbo state. All right, William, is that a question? Any games where the original is better than the reprint? Uh, well, yes, I know you disagree, but Mansions of Madness. That's true. You I, I do that? disagree. <laughs> No, <laughs> you you can I'm you can ready argue to put that. Up the jukes. I really feel like you may be like a, on an island by yourself here. <laughs> I'll go with a very non-confrontational answer. Life, the original life was so much better than the nonsense new ones that are out. Oh, I see what you're. Oh, where they just try to gimmick it up? You mean kind of a thing? Oh well, no, now they streamlined and stuff. But the original life had betting in it where you could bet on numbers to make money it, it was a much more grandiose game the the new ones are like oh, streamlined wow. and happy you've just taken me to school i was unaware um i'll give you another one um runebound second edition versus third edition that's a tough call when i first played you did a lot of very cool stuff i mean a lot of really neat ideas but so much of the heart and soul went out when they made dice traversal around the world Pretty much, yeah, it doesn't matter what I roll. I'm going to move where I want. And, you know, that really got neutered. And, um, and they added, that. That was hey, a big change. oh, I've got a big epic fight. And um, why don't you take over control of this dragon so that you can really work hard to kill me? And it's like, uh, the, the old system was fine. Yes, flipping runes is nice. Now, I should say, when the uh, expansion came out that added cooperative play to Runebound 3rd Edition, oh, baby. But just... Straight, I would always take uh, Runebound Second over Runebound Third if you're just talking Runebound straight. Runebound Second's box. way longer though. That's the problem. It was a it long is, so game. I, yeah, but um, you know, it I, was I've probably only too a long. Player game. Nah, I can certainly true. see that being the case at higher player counts. That's true. But that's a meaningless uh, distinction for me. All right, a lot of people are asking about scariest board game, but board games aren't very scary usually. Maybe Matches of Madness. But question for you: What was scarier, bungee jumping or skydiving? That's a good question. I was terrified in both cases, but I think I would have to go with bungee jumping because I did a tandem skydive. And I still remember in that little tiny you know, puddle hopper plane, we're up there, they slide open the door, I'm first up for whatever reason, and the guy shouting in your ear, put your foot on the strut! You know, because you got to put your feet on, I'm like, oh, I should not do this. But all I had to do is put my foot on the strut so my feet were hanging out, and then he took over. He launched us. He handled the parachute. He did everything, and I was really along for the ride. So there was a brief moment of fear. Bungee jumping, they have you walk the plank. You're literally out there. And again, I don't know why I was first in this case, too. I don't know why this happens to me. But nothing will happen until you take the leap. And everything in your body is telling you, do not do this. You will die. Your body is screaming at you to get down on your hands and knees and crawl gingerly back to the safety of the elevator that you rode up in. Um, this was at Circus Circus in Las Vegas, uh, but yeah, I have no choice. Uh, we have a video of me doing it, and you know, it's, and you know, I was out there for a little while, and everybody was doing three, two, and on a one, I just kind of melt and just kind of fall off because I was I was just so paralyzed with fear. Um, and um, and Jen took a picture when I came back up, and she has a picture of my hand white knuckled grabbing onto a ledge is the first moment i felt safe is when i was back up and i was okay oh, i will never let go of this ledge so i was gonna ask that that's always i've i've not bungee jumped before um i've done the the tandem no the, the no i've not i i would do that i think because there's two reasons i haven't done tandem well three if you count money um yeah. but the, <laughs> the, the one is that um it, it is scary to some degree, but I've always felt like they would need a really huge guy to <laughs> be behind me. Uh, I'm not a small. I'm not a small individual. I so, think actually, in your case, maybe they'd want a really small person to balance out the weight <laughs> ratio for this. Thank you. Shoot. So the thing I've always wondered about bungee jumping is: so you're saying that so you're falling down, you think you're going to die, 
and then it pulls on you and you start bouncing up and you're saying you're still scared at that point? Yes, because this was my experience and I can confirm it was Jen's experience as well. You may look at, oh, wow, that bouncing around stuff is really fun. No, that's just repeated terror. Um, because it's, it's not like a swing. It's, you're discombobulated. <laughs> it all comes at you so fast. And I apologize for taking down. joy in your terror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you know, I'm sure with the repeated um, attempts, I you'd start to you know feed on the adrenaline of it. But that first time, it was just absolutely terrifying. Um, I was apparently literally shivering, and uh, and it was funny too. I was the first one to go, Jen, because she was the lightest. I, I think it was weight. This is why they divided us. She was the last one to go, and while everybody else was going, I was saying, "Honey pie." You, you don't have to do this if you don't want. No one's going to think less of you. And I was, because I, I was just still kind of in a little minor shock. And I was just trying to protect you. You don't want to do this. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was something else. I'm glad I did it. And we decided, hey, let's do it at Circus Circus. Because this isn't just a bunch of people said, let's go out to the bridge and do it. Wee! You know, this was like, okay, they're, they're, they're doing it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're regularly re replacing the bungee and all that. And it felt a little bit more controlled. Plus, there was a little tiny pool down there at the bottom. Not that that would have helped. But, um, <laughs> yes. you know, intellectually, I would say, oh, no, but yeah, the water will break my fall. Yeah, it'll break my body is what it'll do. Um, yeah, it, it, was, it was really something else, um, you know, quite unlike anything else I've ever had to do. That was certainly a scary moment, definitely. Here's a good question. What other game would you like to get a simplified version similar to how Jaws of the Lion simplified Gloomhaven? And just uh, to you clarify, know what? I don't... Jaws of the Line doesn't necessarily simplify Gloomhaven. It just has a rolling tutorial. Yes, yes, there's a few things that Gloomhaven has that it doesn't have, but you're basically playing almost the full version at the end. Yeah. Right, by, yep. by Mission 5, I mean. Yep. So, I mean, do, then do we take that question as which games do we think would really benefit from a Gloom or a Jaws of the Line style tutorial? Or the original, which game do we want, we love, but we just want a maybe more gateway plushes instead of, you know, bigger, heavier game. Because I know the answer to that right off the bat, because it just came up the other day in my uh, in a top ten I did with Ruel Gaviola, and that would be Spirit Island. I love Spirit Island so much, but it is so big, and there is so much going on, and it is so long. But they um, have a tutorial-type system. They do, they do. But I, I, in that case, I'm answering the, which game would I just love to see a lighter version of in general? Got and, it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. In terms of which game could use a tutorial, mom, well, obviously Gloomhaven would have been the big one. Um, it would have been Gloomhaven if it, yeah. if if that hadn't been on the already done. I would have been like, oh man, Gloomhaven could really benefit from that. Uh, yep. I'm trying to think because most games aren't. I mean, Euro games are some pretty heavy Euro games or 18xx games and things, but I don't think they would benefit from a tutorial system. A multi chapter i mean really any euro that has has to have a a rule book that's over 30 pages could probably benefit from a hey let's just play one round and we'll turn off 50 percent of the game so you can get this before you get that before you get the other like uh vinos from vito lasarda hey the first time you play let's just mess with that little grid and how you can move around and there won't be um wine fairs that you have to prepare for you'll just have a winery you'll just try to get your sellers full and and score some points i could see that working in a vito lasarda game because he okay. just my head immediately went to him as big heavy crunchy i mean i i could certainly see that working for lisboa as an example because that's a deep into the pool hey you know good luck as they push you in the rules right. jesse Scholler says childhood toy you wish they would start making again don't they make almost everything? Oh, the magnets. What were those called? Maybe someone in the comments can tell me. There was these. Uh, there were these uh, toys. Well, Mega Machines is and Micro Machines are both in my top ten list. But there's there, there was these little magnetic things where you, they would open and they were like spacemen and everything operated by magnets. You could press a button and it would open up by magnets and. And the people moved. It was like, um, oh, but it was all space. But that sounds really cool. But micro machines. I I still don't know why micro machines have not come back. I always liked them better than Hot Wheels and stuff because you could have a cooler setup with micro machines. Yeah, I can't think of anything because you're right. I mean, everything 
of note stuck around. Uh, I would love to play ca- crossbows and catapults someday again. That would be really cool. You know what I'd love? Uh, I don't know people if you ever still played. Make magnets. Um, I know that people still make magnets. I'm talking about this. <laughs> Come oh, on if now. only we could recapture magnet technology <laughs> in 2020. <laughs> Wistful Tom Vassell quote. Um, <laughs> Crossbows and Catapults was a cool, cool game. But these days, I would love a cooperative version using the same approach that the Dead of Winter Flick 'em Up used. Talk about a wonderful um, mechanism. You know, that, that zombie tower? That was so good. I so want to see somebody expand on that idea to be able to have a cooperative dexterity game. And a cooperative um, crossbows and catapults would be amazing. Yeah. I don't think I sold them, folks. No, 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 no. I'm trying to think because I would worry that they would bring it back and they would make it not as... Not as Clean and cool. And- they would like be like, here's your crossbows and catapults. It's six pieces now. It's not as cool as it was when you were a kid. Oh, um, well, cause you're right. Because there used to be, a, you know, in the same way, you know, the, the hero quests and whatnot. I mean, where they really, well, you know, when Hasbro puts something out, they put everything in that box. And that's I've also found a lot of toys that I thought were, were great. <sighs> when you go back and look at them, they're not as cool as I remember. Like Transformers Indeed. is a good example. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, Transformers, I get them. I'm like, wow, these are kind of junky, you know? <laughs> yep. All righty. Um, <laughs> uh, let me see here. That's best. I like this. This question was like, best easy to follow rule book in a heavy game. I was like, uh, Gloomhaven. <laughs> I have a Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. <laughs> oh, um, someone said no one wants to find orange balls all over their house again. Come on. No, that's not crossbows and catapults. That's weapons and warriors. Oh, crossbows that one and catapults I don't know. use discs. They were called um, carams, sir. Carams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why. Weapons and warriors use called. little orange balls. I tended to like weapons and warriors better, but huh? I can see why it's a pain because, yes, the orange balls scattered all over the place. Yeah. And crossbows and catapults, you needed to have a hard floor surface because they had the, you know, the, uh, what was it? It was the crossbow. You slid across the floor, so you couldn't do it on a carpet. Hmm. Yeah. Did you ever play that? That uh, I played a. I had a game as a kid. Uh, a a board game with these big battleships and stuff, and you shot discs, and they would slide underneath the ship. And then, if you got on the right spot, then the top of the ship would pop off. Wow. Um, and the name of this one. This one I know someone out there knows. It was a huge game. You played it on a big giant mat. So you had all these ships, and in your submarine would shoot these thin discs, and you pull them back and shoot them. They would slide across. And they would go underneath the ship, and then it would hit some rubber band thing, and it would pop off the, the Jeez the, the Louise, ship. that sounds amazing. Oh, it's really cool. And it, I, I've seen this in stores, and again, the name is escaping me. I've seen it in stores, and it has, uh, it's, it's not a cheap thing to get nowadays. Yeah. You know, these, these uh, old, big, giant games tend to be expensive. I'm actually surprised no one's made, like, a smaller version of this. Torpedo Run, that's the name of it. Yes. Wow, that Thank you. Cool. Did Kabuki Jamie. Kid come through for that for you, I bet? No, but I'm sure she would be been right behind it. Me growing up, the number one game I had for such things was Space Battle. Draw a little circle. Oh, he gets to move five. One, two, three, four, five. And he's over there, and we're going to shoot. Oh, I missed. That's a Am game? I the only one? Yeah, did you never do that? You can make a dozen different games. You can make racing games and Space Battle games about, you know, my, my car moves, it moved from there to there. And on my next move, it's going to try and go around the corner and go like that. And you just end up with these little... uh. You, 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 it's, it's very, very cool. At the end of the game, you've got on your A4 an epic space battle of all. You can see where all the, you know, where, where the two fighters are going at each other, or trying to destroy the Death Star or the Battlestar Galactica or whatever version you made for yourself. Man, I, I used to do that a ton in grade school because you need a piece of paper and two pencils, or even one, if uh, if time. Man, for I gotta have a nostalgic episode of board gaming at some point. You got me in this mood for these old games. <laughs> But, folks, that's all the time we have for today. Right. Next week, we'll be back, and it will be... On my huh. channel? Or will we? Oh, are, are you recognizing a scheduling uh, con? I forgot about this. Uh-oh. Keep an eye on Rado's channel to see when we'll be back next week. <laughs> Maybe it'll be Monday. We'll see. It'll be at some point. Uh, all right. All right yeah, well, you can always follow <laughs> us on the... Uh, on the social medias. And you can always find all the episodes if you point your browser to C2C, 
the letter C, the number two, the letter C, dot rotto dot com. That's a playlist of everything we've done. And as soon as Tom makes a new one, I put it on there straight away. All righty. Talk to you all later. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Rotto. Bye-bye. <laughs>